Good day and welcome to the webinar. My name is Adam Myers and I'm the Chief of Population Health here at the Cleveland Clinic. Joining me today is Dr. Michelle Medina, Associate Chief of Clinical Operations, and Dr. Neera Vakari, Associate Chief of Value-Based Operations. We hope you will find the webinar to be both informative and helpful in your journey to improving the health and well-being of the patients that you serve. Let's start with a definition. What is population health anyway? As with many buzzwords, it can be used to mean many different things. The original definition by Kindig and Stoddard states that population health is as follows. The health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. We at the Cleveland Clinic break this down just a bit. We define the population as several things. The existing population of patients that we uh, take care of and are entrusted with, patients and people in the community that we might potentially take care of as patients, and then the community writ large, meaning folks in, in our surrounding areas that potentially need our help that may never come into our facilities for care. So let's move to the health side of that. What is health? Health is a state of being that is free from disease. Ultimately, that's the desired end state. The pursuit of population health involves the promotion of well-being and the treatment of disease by giving adequate attention to all the determinants of health, not just the traditional ones. For us, it involves teams proactively learning and addressing the needs of people and populations, seeking to activate, enlist, and equip them to impact their own health outcomes. Why is this important and why are we talking about it? Healthcare in the United States is at a crossroads. We spend more per capita on healthcare than any other industrialized nation by a wide margin. Our discrete healthcare spend hovers around 18% of our gross domestic product. Medicare spending combined with Social Security exceeds 50% of our federal budget. Now, if we had universal coverage and the best outcomes in the world, some might say that we're getting our money's worth. The reality is we have neither. In fact, while our per capita health care spend is the highest among the top 11 industrialized nations, our outcomes are 11th of the 11. We in the U.S., and even more specifically here at the Cleveland Clinic, excel at highly complex specialized care. As a nation, however, we're not nearly as good at reliably and affordably providing the blocking and tackling basic type of care that all need. Currently, our life expectancy in the U.S. is actually decreasing. This imbalance of spend and outcomes is neither financially sustainable nor morally tolerable. Change is needed and we believe that population health is a key component of that change. Part of that change includes increasing the value of the care that we provide. You're all likely familiar with the classic definition of value, meaning value equals quality over cost. This definition is elegant and easy to understand. The ways to increase value are you can increase quality, lower the cost, or some combination of those. We have found that an expanded approach to value in healthcare built on this classic definition helps us better identify the levers for change in our approach to care. For us, value is the care that is needed, desired, justified, and prioritized, delivered safely, reliably, and affordably with the outcomes and experiences that patients, families, caregivers, communities, and payers desire. Each word represents an opportunity to enhance the value of care provided. What do I mean? Let's just start with the word needed. Care is only needed if you've correctly identified the disease state at hand. For instance, if you believe that a patient has pneumonia and provide the latest, best evidence-based care for pneumonia that is known, it is not helpful or high value if the patient actually has congestive heart failure. To this end, value-based care requires a focus to ensure that we address any cognitive biases and thoroughly ensure the correct diagnosis. Let's move to the word desired. If you have the correct diagnosis and plan to deliver the most efficacious treatment, it's only of high value if the treatment is desired. For example, my mother died of leukemia 18 months ago. During the course of her treatment, 
She was offered the most effective chemotherapy regimen indicated in the literature. After great consideration, she chose not to have that treatment and instead chose to die comfortably with us around her. For her, chemotherapy was of low value. But for someone else with the same disease and a different set of desires, they would define that treatment as high value for them. Taking each word of this approach into consideration has proven fruitful for us as we design and plan for our new model of care. There are several general trends in population health and value-based care that deserve some mention. First of all, healthcare has traditionally been pretty reactive, meaning we wait, we open our clinic, and whoever comes to us that day is who we see. The shift is really becoming much more proactive, managing patients panels, large panels of patients. And with that shift comes a different question from who is on my schedule today to who on our panel needs our attention. How can we reach out to them proactively to assist them in getting healthier? There's also a shift from the inpatient care to outpatient, centralized access to local access where the population lives, brick, aggregating brick and mortar facilities to aggregating lives, a fee-for-value model it has replaced the traditional fee-for-service model as far as the spend goes and the reimbursement. The transactional uh, approach of the historical method for us has shifted to a relational, longitudinal approach. Loan providers has shifted, shifted to teams of providers working together. Our hope is that along the way, we can partner with patients in a way that they become active participants in determining their own health outcomes. The remainder of this webinar will further explore ways to transition to value-based care and some of the ways and the lessons that we have learned here along the way. But first, let's hear from Michelle and Nirav. Nirav, share with us some of your thoughts about the drivers in the move to value. Specifically, what are some of the market drivers? We're seeing that this is a terrific confluence of different drivers that both patients, communities, uh, the marketplace, and even our own internal caregivers are looking for. Uh, specifically, patients are looking for differentiated access. They want to not have to wait three months to see Dr. Myers for a 20-minute appointment, but rather they want to see Dr. Myers today, uh, perhaps through the telephone or through a virtual visit. And that hasn't traditionally been our operating model, so we're working to uh, stand up those capabilities. Additionally, we know that uh, the marketplace in general is looking for more transparency. To your point, if, at least in the simple, elegant definition of uh, value, they want to know what is our quality, what is our cost, and absolutely have a right to that. And our job is to make sure we can produce that in a way that's digestible, but also reflects the complexity of care and populations that different providers might serve. The marketplace is also looking for lower cost solutions. How do we move more care out of the hospital and into the home or virtually? And what we're seeing is not just that the market is now starting to ask for these things, but also that the market is starting to create solutions when either we or others haven't come up with them themselves. So with healthcare being the third largest portion of our economy, with consuming over half of our federal budget, there's a lot of investment happening in the space that we actually see as really exciting because it's devising new opportunities for us to figure out how do we compete, how do we adapt, so that we can meet these outcomes that our patients, our communities, and the marketplace desires. Thanks for that. Michelle, what's in this for the caregivers? Um, I think it's an exciting time for caregivers. When we talk about the change or shift to value, it resonates a lot with why people actually go into um, health care, and specifically why people go into primary care because now we're talking about building relationships over time and really promoting health instead of simply um, reacting to an episode of illness. Um, it means for us that we also have to start thinking about how we do the work of the day differently. So as exciting as that is, it can also be very challenging. There are a lot of legacy things that we do in healthcare, especially how we look at our schedule, how we interact together in the team, who directs the care, that we are really turning over and making sure that people are beginning to understand this is the work of teams. No longer is this about one person directing everything that happens for what a patient needs or desires or has to have in their care in order to be healthy. This is really about the whole team giving their input and being able to work together efficiently. 
So what I'm hearing you both say is that in the market, there's a demand for something different. People want something different. And we believe that that something different is teams working together to proactively meet patients' needs and desires in a way that's longitudinal and relational rather than episodic. Is that what I'm hearing? That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. In conclusion, change is needed in healthcare. Outcomes are not as desired and the spend is not sustainable. We believe that population health powered by value-based care design is key to meaningful and sustainable change. For anyone who is viewing this, we welcome your feedback, contributions, and questions in the future. Thank you.